Barry Gibb here in his letter misses the most important part of the whole great white throne judgment, and that is the word judgment. This is why, this is one reason why people miss the boat on huge scriptural topics because, first of all, they don't even know what God says. I've often said this. We have to understand what God says before we can argue about it or have a reasonable discussion about it. And um, hello, everyone. Martin Zender. This is the Revelation series, and we're talking still about the second death, and I'm reviewing for you a letter that was written me that, to me, is very, very illustrative of how and why people get wrong ideas about the great white throne because they let their emotions get in a way in the way they're concerned about their loved ones and of course but i have better news for their loved ones than they're trying to wring out of the lake of fire which is the second death this is i'm naming this guy his real name's george but i don't want to say that so i'm naming him barry gip i just pulled that out of the air yesterday no i think i pulled it out of the Bee Gees, actually he says this, I thought, why would God resurrect people at the great white throne judgment and immediately throw them into a literal lake of fire? For one thing, my friend, God does not resurrect people at the great white throne and then immediately throw them into a literal lake of fire. First of all, it is a literal lake of fire. Why do you mock the fact that it's a literal lake of fire? I didn't invent the law of the metaphor. And I didn't use the lake of fire to define the second death and the second death to define the lake of fire. But anyway, God judges people. And each what, what happened to this whole section here where the dead, the small and the great, rise before the great white throne and each was judged in accord with their acts. You forgot that part, Barry. That's hugely important. That's the whole reason why the people are being resurrected and so i brought that out to him uh it doesn't make sense because quote you're missing the most critical event at the great white throne which is judgment god does not immediately cast people into the lake of fire upon resurrecting them as you suggest god raises these people judges them and then those whose names are not written in the book of life they're the ones cast into the lake of fire and as i've told you i think it's very rare if someone's name is not written in the book of life. I think that's the exception. I think most people are there because most people are decent people. With notable exceptions. All right, let's go on in this letter. I said, your main difficulty with the great white throne judgment seems to be that nice people, and if you don't remember this, go to yesterday's show. Uh, Barry was very upset that nice people were at the great white throne that nice people who are yet unbelievers are returned to death returned to death they've already been dead nice people die in this world and i'm curious why barry doesn't have a problem with that P nice people who are unbelievers are returned to death along with rotten people who are unbelievers you apparently barry do not have the same difficulty with nice people and rotten people suffering the same common fate now i'm not sure why it's acceptable to you now. It will not be then, except that God's hand is not as plain now as it would be then. And again, here I think is the main difficulty people have, is that God is sending people to the second death. God is doing it. Well, he's doing it now with the first death because he holds the keys of death. Not even a sparrow falls without the active participation of God. The problem is people are tricked today. They think that people die uh, by accidents. There are no such thing as accidents. No such things as accidents. People think that because God's hand is invisible today, therefore it does not exist. And that's another deception. So based on this deception, people look at, oh my God, God is directly sending people to death at the great white throne. But he's doing the same thing now. He's directly sending people to death because he can do it because it's so easy for him to raise people from the dead it's so easy for him that's why it's not as big a deal i mean the death of a loved one is precious in the sight of, a, of the lord the death of one of his children the death of anyone is precious life is precious but sometimes we over preciousize life because to us it's to many of us, not you and me, but to a lot of the world, it's permanent. They're scared of death, and many people live in fear, constant fear of death, because they have not been told of the resurrection of the dead, and they have no confidence in it. We have confidence in the resurrection of the dead. 
Abraham had confidence in the resurrection of the dead. This is why he was willing to thrust a knife into the heart of his son Isaac because he knew the God whom he served. And he knew that that God could easily raise Isaac from the dead before Abraham even pulled the knife out of the heart. I said, you missed the main point of my Willard Conference address, namely that death is not a punishment for what we do, but rather the result of what we are. Otherwise, you would not consider the second death or any death unfair to sinners of varying degree. And I have told, as I have told you folks many times, death is the great equalizer. Now back to my response to Barry here. Back to your heart's desire. Since you want these nice people at the great white throne to survive their judgment and continue living into Eon 5, you, along with Phil Scranton and many others who think that the second death is figurative, you're forcing the second death to be something other than what it is, which is death. You're looking for a gray element. You're looking for some gray area of the white throne judgment to squeeze life from. We have to have something happening here that's fair. But unfortunately, you've chosen the wrong element. The lake of fire, that's the wrong element, which is the second death. You'd be you'd have better luck squeezing orange juice from an apple. That was pretty good. I said that to him. You'd have better luck squeezing orange juice from an apple than the luck you would have trying to squeeze life from the second death. I continue here. Any teaching that would turn a thing called the second death into a wonderful ministry of spiritual illumination has the stain of desperation stuck to it. And it's human desperation because people don't think it's right of God to do this. Literal death is the absence of life. Figurative death is senselessness. What is there besides the literal and the figurative? There's no other usage of death. There's either literal or figurative. In Scripture, death is called an enemy. It is never, either in a literal sense or a figurative one, used to describe a period of either divine illumination or chastisement. That's the thing. I said, what is worse, you are denying the abolition of death at the consummation. How can literal death be abolished if the dead aren't really dead? According to Phil Scranton, and now you, not one being in the universe following the great white throne. Judgment will be dead. Everyone will be alive. Here's Phil's teaching. Uh, and now what I do is I put Phil's teaching next to God. This is Phil's teaching. I believe I'm quoting directly from the book. Following, this is Phil Scranton. Following the great white throne judgment, not one being in the universe will actually be dead. Okay, I'm sorry. I, this is my paraphrase of what Phil's saying. I want to be fair here. Following the great white throne judgment, not one being in the universe will actually be dead. Everyone will be alive. Everyone. They're only figurative dead. This is God's truth. I'm contrasting what Phil just suggested there with God's truth. God's truth is at the consummation, the last enemy is being abolished. Death. I continue. In this vein, according to Phil Scranton, death isn't an enemy at all, but it's a friend that ushers the dead into a life of beneficial, albeit painful, tutelage under redeemed Israel. Yeah, he says that, yeah, I just, oh my gosh, I just remembered this. I believe Phil Scranton says that those Israelites who didn't make the grade, the Israelites who did not become enlightened about the Messiahship of Jesus Christ, those who are not written in the book of life, they also are in the second death. So the second death Israel is serving the role that the, sec that the redeemed Israel will be serving on the new earth, on the redeemed earth, except they're serving it in the second death to the second death nations. So <laughs> during the millennium, we're going to have uh, redeemed Israel teaching the nations that are on the earth. In this crazy second death scenario, we have second death Israel, failed Israelites teaching second death nations. It's just, it's just not right. He says the second, Phil says the second death is figurative. If the second death is figurative, then the abolition of death is figurative as well. And one can no more literally abolish a figure of speech than capture a shadow in a jar. You can't have it both ways, Barry. 
Either the second death is literal, or the great event of 1 Corinthians 15.26, the abolition of death, is the abolition of a figure of speech. Newsflash. I, I shouldn't have said newsflash, but I did. Death is to be abolished, not life. Nobody's abolishing life, they're abolishing death. And then I was a little facetious here. I said, maybe Paul meant to say in 1 Corinthians 15.26, and the last enemy is being abolished, the figurative usage of death. I go back to quoting uh, Barry here. Boy, this is long. This is going to be really interesting. I do go back to quoting Barry. So now, Barry, let me see how much time I have here. All right. So now, Barry, I'm going to take your side. I am. I'm going to take your side. But I first want you to see the emotional basis of your argument. You're questioning of God's justice, your mistaking of death for punishment, and your unconscious glorification of death. And these are the only problems I have with the figurative death argument, and specifically with Barry Gibbs' argument here. The emotional basis of the argument, the questioning of God's justice, the mistaking of death for punishment, because death is not punishment. Death is not punishment. Death is not punishment punishment. It's simply the result of being in Adam. Death is the result. It's your default setting. When you come into this world, you are dying. So the dying process leads to the actual state of death. We learn this very early in God's revelation in Genesis chapter 1. If you eat of the fruit of the tree of life to die, you shall, the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, to die, you shall be dying. To die, ultimately, you shall be dying process. So death, Romans 5, 12, check me on this, death passed into all humanity. So death is not a punishment. This is huge information. Death is not a punishment. It's a result of being an Adam. So what is a punishment? Are you want to know? Yeah, sure. I'll tell you what a punishment is. It's suffering for what you do. There's two problems we have, the things that we do, sins, sins that we do. And for these things, we suffer. And God told Adam in the Garden of Eden, because you have done this thing, then you shall, because you have done this thing, because you have sinned, then you're going to sweat and you're going to produce uh, crops by a terrible trial of a process. And it's going to be tough. Eve, mm, you're going to be pushing hard to push babies into the world and it's going to hurt. So they suffered because of what they did. And likewise today, you reap what you sow. What you do, you reap suffering from. But no matter how good you are, no matter how good acts, no matter how many good acts you do, you still die. So death is something different than suffering. Death is something different than suffering, and suffering is something different than becoming an enemy of God. And this is what also happened. Adam became an enemy of God. Adam became a dying creature because he offended God. This is a deeper problem. He lost fellowship with God. He lost peace with God. And so this is results in death. And Jesus Christ, this is the amazing thing. I should probably close with this. Jesus Christ answers both these needs. He answers the need of sin and death. Sin and death. Sin and death are the two big problems. I told you last week that death was the big problem. It is. But how about sin? Is sin not a big problem? It's huge. Sin and death. And Jesus Christ answers both sin and death. For sin, we suffer. We suffer for our sin. I told you that. And to answer that, Jesus Christ suffered. He suffered on the cross for our sin. But we have another problem. It's death. Did Jesus Christ suffer for death? No. He entered the death state for our sakes. He died. He himself took the most farthest reaching effect of sin anyone can take. And the most farthest reaching effect of sin is death. This is the effect of it. It's not an immediate cause and effect. Let me retract a little bit. It's not an immediate cause and effect. It's the ultimate effect. We reap what we sow. But we became enemies of God, and so because of that, we die. So let me make sure you understand that in case I confused you. We die because of who we have become in Adam because of who we are. And Jesus Christ gave himself, gave himself for us. And he gave himself over to the state of death. And by this, he conquered death. Kind of like fighting fire with fire. He suffered because of our sin. He died because of our state. 
He entered the death state because of our state. Our state is we're dying. It's a state of being. It's a state of being irrespective of acts. See, I'm trying to say this 10 different ways. Death happens irrespective of our sin. It's a state of being. Jesus Christ entered the state of death for that. But while he was suffering and alive and, and writhing on the cross, that's when he dealt with our sin. He didn't deal with death while he was alive. He dealt with death when he died. He entered the state of death to pull us all out. And in his suffering, in his blood, we're saved from sin by his blood. Blood is a figure of speech for suffering, for the soul. He gave his blood for our sins, but he gave his life. He gave his very life for our condition, that is, of being mortals, a mortality that we inherited from Adam. I think what I'm going to do tomorrow is go to Romans 5, and we're going to show you how Jesus Christ answers both sin and death. He answers sin by suffering. He answers death by entering into it himself and rising from it. That is the thing that we have, ladies and gentlemen, that the other religions don't have. We have a Savior who has risen from the dead, but you can't resurrect anyone who does not first die. And he entered death for all of us, and he pulled death, and he abolishes death. He pulled death in. Death couldn't do anything more than what it did to Jesus Christ. And suffering can't do anything more. He tasted the dregs of suffering for every sin, and he went to the depths of the grave for what we have become in Adam, enemies. And he restores enemies and sinners. You see, we're enemies and we're sinners. We offended God's feelings, and we did what God didn't want us to do. We sin, and we're dying. And the great news I give you this morning is that Jesus answers both problems definitively once for all time. And now it's just a matter of relaying this information. And that's what I am. I'm a relayer of information. It's just a matter of that now, of enlightening people. Because Satan can't do anything to stop the facts of the death, the entombment, and the resurrection of Christ. It was too big. It wasn't done in a corner. It was huge. He can't stop it. But what he, what he can stop is the dissemination of the information. Yes, he can sidetrack people. Oh, you don't want to go here. You want to go over here, Satan says. You want to go into church. Yes, so you can become institutionalized and lose sight of all these things I'm telling you. It's a diversion tactic. I'm not going to let that happen. Not on my watch, not on this show. I'm going to bring you the facts. I'm going to bring you the truth of how God is at peace with the world through the cross and how he is going to eliminate sin and death from the universe for all.